Okay, Titus 2, 11 to 14, and I am reading in the New Living. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. And as Paul finishes this letter in the next chapter, may God's grace be with all of you. So a lot of, uh, in life, a lot of training, a lot of training is to teach you, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a job, whether it's sports, whether it's a Lamaze class, it, it's teaching you um, how to respond to a certain situation before it comes. You know, whether that situation's a possibility or an inevitability, when you have training, they want you to say, when you get in a situation, we don't want this to be the first time you've ever thought about it. We want you to have some degree of preparation so that you can respond correctly, so that you can respond in a way that is healthy, so that you won't be blindsided, so things won't be um, totally unraveling inside of your mind or in your actions. And in certain things, we hopefully are conditioned like when you see red lights flashing behind you on the road, you pull over and hope it's not for you, right? Just get to the side and go, yeah, get that guy who is, who is going really fast in front of me. Um, when you hear a fire alarm in school, remember we did fire alarm drills. What do you do in case of a fire alarm? And they would do them over and over again when there wasn't a fire. Because if you waited the first time to ever do a fire drill until there was a fire, that would be pandemonium, people running everywhere. So... When the time comes, it, it's actually a reality. The students can line up and file out, and they've done, it. they've done this before. And there's many things in life that we want, we want to have information that should lead us to a proper response. And we, we wonder what, what our reaction should be. And in the, what we've been covering in Mark chapter 13 is that Christ has been making preparations for his soon departure and been preparing his followers so that they could have an appropriate response. Now, part of this was preparing the nation, or he, he had a lot of things, loose ends to tie up before he went. So we've, we had the uh, confrontation with religious leaders at the temple. We see that everything was building to a head, to his, his imminent death, his betrayal, his murder. But what was providentially forearranged for our salvation, once again, what they meant for evil, he meant for good, for the saving of many lives. And um, he was also then, we see, giving information to those closest to him about what was to come. Because in their minds, what was, about, what was happening wasn't what was anticipated. They had prepared for one thing, and they have a different reality. And now he's telling them even about the future in, in Mark 13 here these last couple of weeks, about what would happen soon wasn't what was anticipated. So he's letting them know before it happens, so he says, so that they will not be overcome when the realities actually occur. And so as we looked at this, um, after looking at what will come and the destruction of the temple, the, the dispersal of the nation, the persecutions, the amount of time they're going to spend that was, they think they're entering into a glorious age and now they're going into the church age. It is a glorious age. We have the Holy Spirit among us. It's a time of reaping for the nations. And I think for us, it's a really glorious age because I know when I look around this room, we don't have a lot of Jewish people in this room. They're welcome. But for so many of us, I mean, when we think of, I think of my own ancestors, at the time that Jesus is in the Holy Land, proclaiming to the Jewish people, they're running around Europe, you know, painting themselves blue, worshiping trees and demons. It's like not a, really, not a really high genetic material. But God looked providentially and said, I can now to these people draw a new people who loves me. To every tribe and tongue and nation. See, the church is just glorious for us. Because the gospel was intended and sent out to all the nations. So it was unexpected but providential. 
Just because things don't go the way you plan does not mean it's bad. In the moment, we may be all upset, we may be confused, we may not like how it is, but we need to first and foremost go to the Lord and say, not my will be done, but your will be done. He knows a lot more than you or I. And that's a good thing because like a lot of us, sometimes we're just making it up as we go. But God has, God has planned this from eternity past. And he's telling us, as he gives us some information after his return, to prepare for his return. To prepare for it. That may be a really unusual uh, thing to say because we've been waiting for more than 1,800 years, more than 2,000 years. Well, I guess not more than 2,000, but close to 2,000. But he gives this parable here from the pig tree. Fig tree. Pig tree is a different thing. The pig tree sounds like, I don't know, some children's story you'd read at bedtime. But let's go here to verse 28. Verse 28 here, still in, the, in chapter 13. Incidentally, this sermon's going to be a little bit strange because we're going to go in like, it's almost like two different sermons back to back. They're both going to deal with preparation, though, preparation of different sorts as we, we are all preparing for Christ to go to the cross. First, what Christ has to say to us, then him, him telling us to be prepared, and then another person preparing him. So if you're following this morning, Christ telling us to be prepared, our response to be prepared, and someone else preparing him for what's to come. That's kind of how it'll be broken up. But let's start here. Verse 28. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. As soon as its branch has become tender and sprouts its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Watch out and stay alert, for you do not know when the appointed time is. It is like a man away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay alert. Therefore, stay alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, so that he does not come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you all is stay alert. So as we start here, we see this parable. It's a fig tree, a metaphor of believers knowing perhaps the general season, but not the specific time of Christ's return. I mean, the fig was a late bloomer. It, it, it was, gave its fruit in the summer, not in the spring. But even before that, they would know that the fruit was coming because the plant, after a winter, would start to grow leaves again. And we know that as our leaves, whether you have an apple tree or a cherry tree or any number of trees, or whether you even have a fig tree, when the leaves drop off, you know it's winter and, and, the, and the fruit is not soon. But when it begins to sprout its leaves again, you know that spring has come and soon it will bear fruit. And, and we, are, we are told with this to be prepared. We don't know when he's coming, not specifically, but we should always live in anticipation of his coming. Um, a lot of people with a fig tree here have said, look, this generation will not pass away. What exactly does that mean? And, and a whole prophetic interest happened with the rebirth of the nation of Israel, and rightly so, rightly so, because very much you're like, leaves are starting to appear on the tree. This is, this is a big deal. But some people have started to say, what does it mean that this generation will not pass away? Is that, is that 1948? Is that 1967? Does it mean that this, this iteration of the nation of Israel will not pass away? There's, there's different speculations on just because we're in the time, perhaps, of Christ's return, and even if it's longer than we think, we should be prepared for Christ's return. It, it looks like we're seeing life where before there was, there was a barrenness. And so, now, by the way, each generation has had so many false date setters. That's, that, that's, a, bad, that's a bad thing, right? Don't go setting dates. We've talked about this before. 88 reasons that Christ is coming back in 1988. 
If he did, we missed it. The tribulation happened, apparently wasn't that big of a deal. We are now in the millennial kingdom. What a disappointment, right? Um, no, so what we say, but every generation, when they give these false dates, it just undermines our hope and our expectation and the truth that Christ is coming back. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be anticipating it, even saying, it looks close. But the point here is Jesus says over and over, you do not know when I am coming. Only the Father knows when I am coming. But when you see these things happening, you probably, probably should live in anticipation, in expectation of Christ's coming. It's not the time to delay anymore. We should, it should motivate us, make, motivate us to be prepared for his coming, to be about our labor, to be about his business. John Wolverd says that believers need to be faithful, to be recognizing the signs of the times, and to be living in such a way that they are ready for the Lord's return. We're to be in a state of readiness. So you, when, you remember back in school, you had a couple different types of teachers, whether this was high school, whether it was college, whether it was some, some other class that you took. You have teachers that are very regimented. You'll have the midterm on this date and the final on this date. And if you're a student like I was, you'd be like, oh, great. I don't have to study for the final until like 48 hours before. Uh, things I've tried to like teach my children to go a different direction. Tried to, I always tried to spin as many plates as I could academically, take a really heavy load, see how many I could get without dropping any. Some semesters that worked, some that didn't. But you had those other teachers who they would say, like, here's your final. You have to know where the final is, but all throughout my class, we're going to have pop quizzes. Those classes had to be different. You had to be in a state of readiness. You had to be aware of all the information all the time because you could walk in on a given class day, and all of a sudden you just got a quiz, and it's like, uh-oh. You couldn't, you couldn't wait, you couldn't prepare, you couldn't plan. Christ's coming is more like a pop quiz. You know it's coming. You know it's during this course. You have a general idea of when it might be, but you want to be prepared. You want to be prepared all the time. You don't want to have any unfinished business. Whether that's someone you want to share Christ with, whether that's something you need to get right with God or a neighbor or someone else. He says, live in expectation of my return. In the parallel passage in Matthew 24, in verse 36, we read, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were all eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. See, the men in Noah's day didn't recognize the times. They didn't recognize that the days were short. And specifically that their own days were short. And they, they should have been prepared. There was a giant boat being built. It wasn't a small little, small little vessel. It was pretty evident. And the Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. That means he is declaring what God is doing before that wicked generation. But the people of the day did not heed him. They did not recognize at times. They did not respond as they should have been. We, we need to be different. We know Christ is returning. It's like when your parents leave and they say, hey, we're going to be back. Make sure your chores are done. Some of you are grandparents now and you still remember that. Some of you remember as you're just not doing your chores, whether it's for a weekend or for a day. And then at the last minute you're like, it's an hour before mom and dad get home. Start cleaning. And you and, and, and you're just have a miserable hour and everyone's rushing around trying to clean as well as you can or just stuffing things in nooks and crannies where they won't find them. Um, and what a, what a horrible, horrible time when sometimes the parents would come home early. We, we need to live. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. We need to be prepared. Well, with all that, um, as, we, as we consider that the times are nearing, and that's just like I said all through this last several weeks, of course they're nearing because today we're closer than yesterday. 
Well, the truth is Israel is back in the land after being missing for 1,800 years, more than 1,800 years. But think about that. 70 AD, they're gone. And then in, in um, 1948, they were back. It's a really curious thing. It's one of the testimonies that, of God's word in Scripture to say that this would come to pass, and it has. If nothing else, this is just a great validation that when Jesus says something will happen, when God says something will happen, it will happen. It may take a while by our reckoning. It may, we may not understand how it will happen, but when it will happen, it will because God said so. I mean, the, and when we look today, all the players are present in Christ's prophecy. These have all those key elements back for their fulfillment. I would say it's very ready. The table is set. It's kind of like Thanksgiving dinner, though. Do you ever have those Thanksgiving dinners where your family says, we're going to eat at one, and the turkey just takes forever, and then two o'clock comes and three o'clock comes. You watch another football game, and you're starving. They're like, don't eat. You're going to spoil your dinner. And you're like, dinner was supposed to be two hours ago. You keep trying to sneak in and like a little piece of one of the sides. And eventually, 4, 4.30, whenever it is, the turkey, which took too long, is finally ready. You just don't know. But I would say, you know the meal is coming. The table is set. And I'd say that's what today looks like. Do I, do I have any confirmation of that? I don't. But whether it's me departing to go to be with the Lord, which I also don't know what that date is. I could die right now. That would be kind of a memorable sermon for you. But, uh, or whether it's Christ coming, I, I don't know. I need to live in anticipation and not leave unfulfilled responsibilities. We need to live both with urgency and with endurance. Because we don't know when. And he gave the illustration of the robber. If they had known when the robber was coming, they would have been prepared. That's why he tells the gate man not to fall asleep. You don't know when the robber's coming. He doesn't punch a clock like you or I. Well, I can only uh, do my, uh, my stealing between 9 and 5. I'll have to go home now. Have a good night. I used to watch, uh, I don't know if you remember this, um, Jay Leno, when he used to be on TV, he used to have this segment of ridiculous headlines. Headline news is, I think, what he called it. And he'd go from newspapers and articles and just put things up like, Signs even. I had one of the books, one of the signs in America, caution, water on road during rain, you know, things like that. You're like, thanks. Uh, another one, which was in a paper, it was a reward. It says, reward. It was a reward for, leading, for information leading to the arrest of the person who repeatedly robs the car wash every other Tuesday night between 9 p.m. and midnight. Like, how hard, to, how hard is it going to be to catch that guy? He, he robs a store every other Tuesday between 9 p.m. and midnight. I'm thinking, maybe just have someone watching? But that's not how it normally works, right? When you have to be prepared at all times. So Christ is coming back. Be on the lookout. But stay at work. Because we have to live both as if the time is short and, to, and also to labor with endurance. We have two different goals, two different um, charges. Because what we know is whatever time we have been given, we have been given to live as his witnesses and we have a job to do. Well, now we're going to turn the page and it's a different type of preparation. So let's continue on into, into, um, into Mark 14. See, the goal of this all, I, I could have divided this up more, but is to get through with Mark before Christmas is over, because in the beginning of January, we have a brand new series on foundations. So we, I've got a hard deadline of January 1st, um, so, but, so we're going to move here and look at the next few verses. We see now, um, after these things, now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were two days away. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him covertly and kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there will be a riot of the people. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, he was reclining at the table, and a woman came with an alabaster vial, a very expensive perfume of pure nard. She broke the vial and poured the perfume over his head. 
But there were some indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume could have been sold for over 300 denarii. Uh, By the way, remember, a denarius was a day's wages. So 300 days of work for this perfume. And the money could have been given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a good deed for me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the entire world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. So we we, we see here, now this is a different type of preparation. Um, But I want to to give a couple details of this passage. In Jesus' ministry, there was at least two different anointings and not possibly three. There's either two or three. There's one earlier in the chapter of Luke where there's a sinful woman coming and washing his feet with her tears and pouring perfume on him. Um, And that was at the house of a Pharisee, not of a leper. And, And Jesus is telling her, When people go, oh, if he only knew who the sinful woman was, why would he allow her to touch him? And Jesus says to his host, he goes, who do you think will love me more? He who has uh, been forgiven much or forgiven little? And and they have that whole interaction, entering with him to say, uh, your sins are forgiven. But this is, not, this is not that passage. That was much earlier in his ministry. And then we see Matthew and Mark have the same account written down, and there's another account in John. And the question is, is this the same account, or is he anointed two times in the last week of his life? And I would say it's, it's hard to be definitive about that. Because when you first read, it says, well, one says eight days, and one says two days, which is really confusing because the way they talked about the Passover is not always the same. Some people would say it could be two days before the entire feast. There's actually two together, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. Or they could be talking about the specific day of the Passover or the Holy Week. And so the best thing I can just tell you is we're not really certain whether John's account and Mark's account are the same passage or two different ones. There's different emphasis recorded for sure. And the way that you have different witnesses talk about, you know, details of any event can make that confusing. Um, It wouldn't be, now, these would be rare instances with expensive perfume, um, but they would... uh, be a lot more common than today. Like if I walked up to one of you today and poured perfume all over your head, you probably wouldn't think of that as a blessing, right? It was, it was more culturally understood to be a way to acknowledge and to honor someone. And coming into Christ's last week of his life, he is, he is being honored by some of the people who, who had a deep heart for him. Um, all four gospels do present an account of Jesus being anointed by a woman with a costly jar of perfume. And so... Uh, Matthew and Mark relate the same event. They don't give the woman's name. Luke tells of a different, a different woman, also anonymous. And in John, uh, we, we read about Mary of Bethany, the sister to Martha and Lazarus. And so because of the different feasts, whether it's two or three, and it's not ultimately as important as what we take from these. Um, and you go, well, well, could he really have had two anointings in a week? Well, Yeah. I remember when we used to, when Lori and I were first married, um, we lived in San Diego County, and Lori's family lived in San Diego County, and my family was living there, and Christmas was, it was many Christmases, it really was like the 12th day of Christmas. On the 23rd, we met with Lori's extended families, all the aunts and uncles. On the 24th, for Christmas Eve, we met with my family. On Christmas morning, it was just Lori and my time together. But then Christmas Eve, we were back with her family. So it was like four Christmases every year. And it was a lot of fun because we didn't have any kids at that point either. So it was just like, well, more food, more presents. Um, but, it, but it was busy. And so there, there could be a lot going on here. There can be multiple occasions, and it's not contradictory. But this anointing is, is, um, is going to be a, a sealed container Once it's broken open, it can't be resealed. Contained a whole pound. This could have even been like this woman's marriage dowry. This would have been an important, valuable possession. Probably her most valuable possession for most women. 
And it's also likely that the being anointed on the head the way that he is right now would have reminded the Jews present of the anointing of a king. This isn't just a strange cultural way to honor Christ that we don't understand, but it was something symbolic of the recognition of the king. Remember, he's just come into Jerusalem as the king to the crowds with the palm branches. And she is honoring him and recognizing him. But also, as he says, and this would have been true as well, it was a symbol of burial. That was the other, another time when they would pour perfume. Well, she's doing this beautiful thing, and there's a little bit of a pushback. And like, why so much money? There are those that were present that called it a waste because they could not have found in their hearts the similar desire to pay such an expense to honor Christ. And when we think about that, when you look at what someone will give for Christ, and what Christ calls each of us, what one person does is not necessarily what the other person should do. We're not at all trying to put like dollar signs on our devotion. Some people are very faithful to Christ, and if we look at them and go like, oh, what a waste. No, no, we, we have to let each person be led in a cheerful giver and give as, as, as God leads them and as they want to give. And this woman has this costly thing, and she wants to give it all to Jesus. That's not everyone's calling. We know that. Not all of you are called to go sell your homes, right? And, uh, but she has them present. And we seem to th- see from the text that she knows her time to honor him is rapidly closing. And so she does. And instead of being in awe of such a giant gift, so many people there are criticizing the gift. Shouldn't this have been given to the poor? Judas himself, we know, he was complaining from other passages, whether in this time or another time. The Bible says that's because he was the money keeper for the group and he used to skim the funds for his own purposes. The Gospel of John tells us that he used to steal from the purse. But Jesus pushes back, both past their real and their feigned objections, to call this a beautiful thing. And he says here, he goes, she has done a good thing for me. For you always will have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. And she has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the entire world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. You know, what a beautiful reward that we're still talking about it. The people around her didn't understand, but today we have an example of devotion. Somebody who truly loved her Savior. And she honored Jesus. Sadly, that's not the response of everyone. We already um, started to talk about Judas. And in the conclusion of this here, if we go to verse 10, it says, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And they were delighted when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at the opportune time. See, the woman honors Jesus and Judas. Well, his response is quite different. You may want to ask why now. Ultimately, we don't know why now. I've, I've given that some thought over the years. We know he's upset. He didn't get any portion of, of this money. He's probably also upset, it look, and, and you've got to con- consider this from his point of view, and I, I don't mean to be, like I said, in his head, but his meal train looks like it's running out. Some people followed Christ, and you even hear those who had much better reasons for following Christ saying, hey, do we get to sit at your right and your left when you set up the kingdom? They're, they're kind of asking, what's in this for me? And Judah seems to have an overdeveloped sense of that. What's in this for me? But now he sees Christ coming to Jerusalem and says, like, I'm going to die. The kingdom's not coming now. And, oh, this money, which you could have got as a final payday, you don't get any of that either. And you can probably, you can feel his frustration. 
and his anger. He says, this didn't match what I planned. I wanted a Messiah to have a glorious kingdom, to give me an important position. Well, he's upset. And he makes the worst possible decision he possibly can. His participation seems to be largely dependent on what he could get. This woman has made a great financial sacrifice because she wanted to give to Jesus. Nonetheless, we see that the stage is set for what's about to happen. Jesus will shortly be handed over to the religious leaders. Well, as we, as we wrap this up and consider what we should do, what we should do uh, with the different passages we've examined today, I think there's two things we want to look at. We need to live faithfully, and I hope, and I hope that our hearts would be in the place where we live in adoration. Um, that we can, we can do both things. Jesus counsels us time and time again throughout the Gospels, but here at the end, he's telling the disciples, be faithful. He's telling us as the church in that generation, which will now not have him physically present, to be alert, to be faithful. We need to be about his business. And when we compare this to the closing about Judas, who was obviously not faithful to the end, that we, we want to say, but we, but we should be about our Savior because he deserves our worship, our devotion, our love, our actions. He didn't, he didn't just save us to sit idly by and to be like, thanks so much for blessing me, but rather we need to be eager for his return and in the, in the moment living for his pleasure, for his honor, for his purposes. There are many who seek after Jesus only for themselves. I'm not saying that's entirely wrong. A lot of you came to Christ because it was a fear of judgment, to save yourself. That's a good place to start. It's a bad place to end. But rather, as we grow in a relationship with God and we see his great love for us, which we cannot match, his gifts to us, which we cannot repay, he is the greatest giver And he blesses us far beyond our expectations and far beyond what we deserve. Not in this life, ultimately. You may, some of you, I say that, go like, well, where's my blessings? That's kind of where Judas was. He couldn't look ahead to the promise. But we're called to live by faith, to look ahead. Nevertheless, too many um, seek after Jesus only for themselves. They don't want to be right with God, not really. They want to use their religion to bless themselves. But this woman that we examined at the end, Mary later or on the same occasion, loved Jesus. And the sacrifice was not to gain favor, but to honor him. And I and I hope, I hope that we, all of us here, would honor and love Jesus with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. I mean, there's so many contrasts here. The woman who shows her love and devotion. Those whose love, who love Jesus, but not so selflessly surrounding him. Judas, further removed, who doesn't want to honor Jesus, but wants to honor himself or enrich himself. And the religious leaders who are desiring to destroy him. And so as we consider this, I hope we look and consider and pray about who we would be and who we aspire to be and asking God to mold our hearts to be true worshipers, to true followers, in spirit and in truth, in heart, and not just in action. But remember, as we already said, you, you, you can't outgive God. If Judas would have been wondering what was in it for me, he, he, missed, he missed entirely. Because once you've walked with the Lord long enough, we understand that as I've already said, you can't outgive God. In fact, the only reason we love is because he first loved us. We know that from 1 John chapter 4. And uh, he has given to us who did not deserve his love, who did not deserve his salvation. And his gift was of life, was of forgiveness, was of forever, and was to be called his children if we would receive it. So I, I, I hope until his return or until he calls us home that we will be about his business. And I hope it won't be just out of obligation, but out of a sincere thankfulness, a sincere heart. Uh, he's been preparing his followers for what is to come. He's been preparing us 
for our service today. And maybe we, we should respond appropriately in light of who he is and what he's done for us in both eager anticipation and in faithfulness until he calls us home. So let's go ahead and let's pray, and then you'll be dismissed. Lord in heaven, thank you so much.